Well, welcome to Portico. If you're joining us online, if you're here in the room, it's great to have you with us. You know, Dwayne, uh, I've watched that video a number of times. They just sent that over to us so that we could give an update to the church family. I love it. Every time I watch that, I just love seeing the people that were impacted. So real. The need is so high. And as we do this together, we're helping people find their way back to God. And there's just nothing like it. When they get them on the camera, don't you just feel connected right into that story? So your generosity is making a difference. And the many of you that have served in Cornerstone, thank you over the years because uh, you know what it is to be right there on the streets changing people's lives and to seeing practical needs being met. Well, Padre, that's my nickname for Pastor Dwayne. If you're wondering, that's, this is Padre in my world. Great to have you on stage with us. Well, it's good to be here, Pastor Doug, and good to have all of you here with us and you online as well. I'm a little worried when he comes up with my nickname. He hasn't revealed it yet, but... But we'll, we'll figure that out a little I'm bit later. I'm working on it. Yeah, you are working on it. I know you are. Well, it's great to have you here. We're, we're in a series. Grab your Bibles, get your uh, notebooks, your apps out. And we're in a, a series right now. It's called Hidden Treasures. Hidden Treasures. Now, how many of you are those people that when you're out in the park or you're down at the beach, you're kind of scouting a little bit? Come on. Yeah, there you go. You don't have the wand. You know, you're not the one with the big wand that's scanning the surface of the soil, but you're going, man, if I could find a treasure, wouldn't this be fantastic? So I didn't have a chance to tell Pastor Dwayne this, but a number of years ago, we were in Israel. We took a tour to Israel, and one of the unique features of that trip is we went over to Jerusalem, and they had an archaeological dig that was going on, and they allowed us to go to a site where they would sift through the debris from the construction site. And so I jumped in. I was part of one of the teams, and it was me and another lady, and we were sifting through some stuff. And we'd gone through the day, and the way it works is they just bring you buckets of dirt, and you throw it into this, you know, sort of a screen. You sift through it, wash it with water, and you're looking for shards of pottery or pieces of marble or clay tile, just things that the archaeologist on site could identify. And amazing, these, these archaeologists, they can take you almost right into the, within a 10-year span of when those articles mm -hmm. Uh, were produced. So we were doing our work, and right towards the end of the time that we were there, we were down to the bottom, and the water washed across, and I saw this dark circular object in the bottom. And right away, about the size of a penny, and I knew that's, that's not an ordinary piece. So we kept screening down, and we got down to the bottom, and it was this heavy, heavy circular, what appeared to be a coin, but I couldn't tell for sure. And I put it in the bottom, the palm of my hand, and I go, man, that looks like a coin. And we called the archaeologist over, they came over, looked at it, and right away verified. They go, that's a good find. Grabbed it and left. <laughs> I sifted through the dirt for that. I think it's finders keepers. Isn't that how that works on you? Any, anything there. You know that when you're working in a restricted zone like that, anything that has to do with history, of course, belongs to the state. And so we recognize that. Now, that was okay. But before we left, they would take all the treasures that we found, and they would explain them real quickly. And they'd say, well, this group here you found, it was a little oil lamp that was made out of clay, and here's the shape and the size of it. This is a marble tile. This was probably used over in the temple. And they could, you know, connect stuff to locations. It was amazing to watch that. The one thing that was missing, anybody want to guess? Yeah, you were with me, weren't you? I was like, where's the coin? So we actually asked about the coin because it was missing. They had already cataloged and bagged the coin. So we asked them. They went and they brought it back so we could get a picture of it. And when I asked, well, why did you do that? And they said, because it's a Jewish coin that would have been minted from the first century. Wow. And because it was found in that location, it's evidence of the presence of the Jewish people in the first century at the Temple Mount. And they go, so it's irrefutable evidence for us that, that there was those, the people were present there. That's the power of these hidden treasures. Now, don't go dig up your backyards if you're living in the area. <laughs> Chances are you're not going to find that. But, but, oh, you don't have a backyard? <laughs> oh, dig in your neighbors. Okay. <laughs> but we're, we're doing this with the Bible right now. We're in the books called the Minor Prophets, and we're digging for hidden treasures. So where are we going to go today? Today we're going to go in Haggai. Uh, so Haggai is between Zechariah and Zephaniah, I believe. That's it. And uh, Haggai, um, we're going to go there. So that's in the Old Testament. So if you could turn your Bibles there. And before we uh, get right into it, we did have a social media question. What does home mean to you? And some of the answers that we got were the following. Uh, somebody said that home to them meant good food. 
Good food. Mm. Anybody else relate? Okay, so like I said in the first service, if your spouse is sitting beside you and you have your hand down, I'm available for counseling after. <laughs> anyway, um, others people said that uh, home meant uh, comfort, a place where they could go and just be comforted. And someone said home is where the heart is, well, which is? That's like a Hallmark moment right yes. there. Home is where the heart is, isn't it? We should make a movie about that. That's a, it's a good response, though. Thank you, by the way, for re- replying. So I got thinking, you know, Dwayne, when we were talking about this, for me, I was reflecting. I wrote a couple of things down. When I think about home, not only do I go back to my childhood, but, you know, the thing that really strikes me about home was there's no pretense. I was free to be myself. There was never, I never had an expectation put on me to be anyone other than who I was when I was born into that family, just like these kids that we dedicated this morning, that we were permission to grow with our unique personalities and our individual skills and our gifts. All of that is what made part of our composition. That's what made us family. And so when you ask about home, I immediately go, I am free to be who I am, and I I don't have to put on any airs. I don't have to perform. It's a place that's safe for me. What about you? Yeah, for me, it's rest. Um, Home, when I think of home, it's a place where I can relax. It's a place where I can uh, relieve myself of the tensions of the day. Um, It's a place where I can, I'm going to lay my head and I'm going to sleep. I'm going to sleep there comfortably. Uh, That's what home is to me. So you're going, well, why home and why the title, Finding Your Way Home? It's because when you get into Haggai, you realize that God raises this prophet to speak to the people, and so much of this is directed towards the fact that they had been exiled into Babylon, and they are now returning home. They're actually been permission to go back and occupy their land. So we're going to have a look at that today. And so the 70 years of exile is over, and they have made their way back into the land. So when you open up the book of Haggai, if you can turn there, we're going to go to chapter 1 and verse 3. When you begin to read the story, here's what you need to understand. Some of the exiles have now returned back into the land of Israel and settled in Jerusalem and the villages and the land around that area. And they've been there for a period of time. And as they find their way home, it's interesting what God would say to them through this prophet. So look at what it says in verse 3. So the Lord sent this message to the prophet Haggai. Why are you living in luxurious houses while my house lies in ruins? This is what the Lord of Heaven's army says. Look what's happening to you. You have planted much, but you harvest little. You eat, but you're not satisfied. You drink, but you're still thirsty. You put on clothes, but you cannot keep warm. Your wages disappear as though you were putting them in pockets that are filled with holes. So this is what the Lord of Heaven's army says. Look what's happened to you. Now go up into the hills, bring down timber, and rebuild my house. Then I will take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You hoped for rich harvests, but they were poor. And when you brought your harvest home, I blew it away. Why? Because my house lies in ruins, says the Lord of heaven's armies, while all of you are busy building your own fine houses. So here's what we know, that Zerubbabel had led the exiles back in to the land. So they're returning to the state where they were before being carried off to Babylon, but they hadn't re-engaged in their worship and their practice and their faith the way that God would expect them to do and had called them to do. And so as we look at this today, what we're going to do is look at the overall structure of the book, but really identify something that we can live with, because that's where it really becomes practical. It's got to be practical if it's going to work in our lives and our faith. So we're going to give you three maxims. A maxim is really, if you want to know what it is, it's really just a fundamental principle or a rule of conduct. So three rules of conduct by life by which we can live the life that God has called us to do. So let's jump in, let's do that, and let's do a couple together. Here's the first one I want you to write down. The first maxim, negligence has consequences. That's what you see when you read the letter of the words of the prophet, that negligence has consequences. So let's make this practical, because that's where we are. How many of you, by a show of hands, love your dentist? Let's try another way. How many of you just dread going to the dentist? There you are. Isn't it interesting that we all have this, I feel bad for dentists. 
You know, it's a profession. It's a necessary profession, but nobody likes to go to. You don't mind, though, do you? I like going to my dentist because they got a TV that I can watch while they're working on me. <laughs> it's it's kind of like home. Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but, you know, here's the thing. You get a little toothache, or you know that you should be brushing more, or you know your dental care is not quite there, and you know that the negligence is going to have consequences down the road, but you're willing to put up with the negligence and then dread the consequence later on. It's not just the dental thing. We do this when it comes to our health. We do this when it comes to our home maintenance. We do this when it comes to our auto maintenance. We neglect things, and then we end up having to suffer the consequences of the neglect. And this is exactly what Haggai is speaking to in the text here. The exile, so I'm going to just real quickly set it up, and then we're going to jump in a little bit deeper, Dwayne. Right? But the exile, so go back to 605 BC. And if you've been with us for a number of months, you've heard us talk about timelines in the book of Daniel. 605 BC is when the Babylonians carried a group of those from Judah into exile. And over the next few years, they would all be exiled to Babylon. Jeremiah the prophet prophesies for 70 years, you will live in exile. Daniel realizes that. He begins to pray that God would remember his promise to release his people from captivity. 539 BC, Cyrus conquers Babylon. You may remember the story out of the book of Daniel. Belshazzar is throwing a big party, using the goblets from the temple. Suddenly, their finger appears writing on the wall. Many, many, many. You remember that? And then that's the night that he would die, and that's when the kingdom would fall. And now Medes and Persians have taken over as the world empire. Cyrus, the leader of Persia, issues a decree, and he says, all those who had been exiled, you can go home. Imagine just imagine what it must have been like if you were living there and if you were one of the Jewish exiles. We get to go home. Like for 70 years, we've heard stories. For 70 years, we've wondered what's been going on in our homeland. And now we get to go back. So you would think under Zerubbabel and Joshua, the high priest, that you would have this whole group of people that would go back, but they didn't. A group of exiles returned. So they go back in 539 BC and then 18, almost 19 years later, God raises up a man by the name of Haggai, and he said, I need you to speak to the people, because for the last 18 years, they have not been rebuilding the temple, and they were supposed to come and rebuild the temple. So you have all of this connection that has taken place. In fact, in Haggai 1-2, here's what we read. Verse 2, it says, this is what the Lord of Heaven's army says. The people are saying, the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. And God is saying, why are you saying that? Because the temple is important to who we are. And their negligence over the last 18 years was having significant consequence on the people. Yeah, so what we can learn from this as we're reading it is that what they were going through is that as they neglected the centrality of God in their lives, it had impact on their lives. And we face the same thing. When we neglect the centrality of God in our lives, it has impact on our lives. You see, what had happened is that they had gotten to the point where God was a part of their life, but he wasn't central. And I wonder how many of us, if we were honest, could say we've been there. There might be people who are listening. There might be people who are watching. Maybe that's where you are right now. But it's interesting because when you consider the verses that we've looked at so far in Haggai, you understand that they had failed to give honor to God, the same God who brought them out of exile, they had forgotten him. And it's almost like even though they had been brought out of Babylon, Babylon was still in them. And it was causing an issue between them and the Lord. One of the, one of the sources that I was looking at here was saying how basically what they were suffering now was the economic curses of the covenant. And it reminded me that these people were tied to God by a covenant. They're tied to God by an agreement of sorts, and they weren't living to their end of the agreement. Now, when I came on staff um, as a part of the pastoral staff, 
I was told how wonderful I was. I think you guys really like my wife more than you like me, but I was told how wonderful I was and so on and so forth. That's a joke. But how, you know, all these things. But, but here's the thing. Any organization that you join, you enter into an agreement or a covenant. When I came on staff as a pastor here, I entered into an agreement that I would adhere to the staff policy. When you go to, for a job, you enter agreement. By the way, when we get married, we, went, we enter into a covenant. The people that Haggai was prophesying to, they were in covenant relationship with God and they had forgotten that they had neglected it and it moved them off center to the point where they had forgotten that the same one who gave them this freedom was also asking for them to be in close relationship with them. So if you think about this relationship that they have with God, you go, why for 18 years would you just neglect it? Now, we don't have time, obviously, by the service time to unpack all of this, but they'd gone back and they'd laid the foundation stones of the temple, and then they kind of like, oh, you know what, that's good, we're good. Mm. And they went off and they built their homes. So you start to look into this, and, and I like the fact you pointed this out. Some of them, when they came from Babylon, they carried Babylon with them. Mm-hmm. They remembered the wealth and the prosperity. In fact, historically, you can go back and see historical evidence today where there had been wealthy Jewish business practitioners living in Babylon, trading money in the trade business, in the investment or real estate side of the business. There are records that they still have showing this. So you have people that were so enmeshed in Babylon that they go, who needs Judah? Mm -hmm. I've got a much better way to live. And there's kind of a cautionary tale there for us, isn't there? Absolutely. Then you have another group. And again, if you're familiar with the scripture, you would know that if I said Samaria, that was where North Israel was, the Northern Kingdom. They had been exiled back in 722 BC. That's the 10 lost tribes. So they're gone. They were exiled out. But when Assyria exiled them, they took five nations and repopulated Samaria with five nations. So why did the Jews who returned stop building the temple? If you read Ezra and you read Nehemiah, you'll see there was constantly interference from the people of Samaria trying to stop the construction of the temple. You go, well, why would they do that? Well, it's because the people of Samaria thought that they too worshipped God. They had many gods, but they thought they worshipped Jehovah as well. So they said, let us help you rebuild the temple. And when those who were exiles that were in the land were back, they said, no, no way. You're mixed race. You're intermarried. You're not going to be a part of this. We are God's covenant people. You can't be a part of the... So they started to persecute them and give hardship and write to the king and slowed the the construction process. Hmm. So you got this mixture. And then you have this last one. You got people that are living in the land, and we read about this in the first verses. They became successful. Their homes were beautiful homes. Their crops were beginning to grow. And so the general pronouncement of the prophet isn't to singular homes. God was talking to the nation as a whole. But some of the people were doing very, very well, and they're going, well, why should I give to the temple when I'm building my own kingdom? And it it just got me thinking so often what happens is we get so enmeshed inside of our culture, we forget that the Bible says that we are foreigners or strangers, aliens, we're sojourners, that we don't live in towers, we live in tents. Hmm. But often what we do is we put our focus on our towers. And God is going, when you neglect who you are and you neglect the historic representation of what that covenant represents, there are consequences in our lives. Absolutely. So we want to go to the second part, our second maxim today. Clarify your priorities. Clarify your priorities. This is what they were being asked to do. So we already read Haggai chapter 1, verses 7 and 9, but it'll come on the screen again, I believe. And if you notice there, you'll get to a part where in verse 9, um, the prophet is speaking, God speaking through the prophet, and he says, you hope for rich harvests, but they were poor. And when you brought your harvest home, I blew it away. The I is God. God is actually saying, I have moved against this nation in order to get them back to what should be important, which was God's house. Now, when I was thinking about this, I think that God was blessing them with divine dissatisfaction. 
divine dissatisfaction. It shook them up and it got them to the place of coming back to remember, hey, we need to rebuild this temple because we want to be in relationship, in covenant with God. Now in Numbers chapter 7, verse 89, it talks a little bit about the temple there. It says that's where uh, Moses went to meet with God. We understand that the temple was not a place that you would take lightly. It was a place that you would go, and that's where you are going to do business with God, so to speak. We also understand in the New Testament that Jesus was so zealous for the temple that he said that my house would be called a house of prayer. When they were selling things in the temple, he was very upset. So when God comes along and he says to his people, you know, all of the things that I'm doing, I'm actually blowing them away and I'm giving you this divine dissatisfaction, it's actually a gift. Why is it a gift? Well, I think about the principle that we find in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. I'm not going to read it verbatim. It's not going to come on the screen. But it says, we should not despise the discipline of the Lord because he disciplines them as a father would discipline his sons. He disciplines us as a father would discipline his sons. So, God comes along here and is basically giving the people the prescription to return to him, which is wonderful because a lot of times when the prophets come, they may say, yes, this is happening, but they always provide a way back home to him. You know, the beauty of of the story here is that the prophet points out that when there's negligence in your life, it's easy to see the consequence. And you start going oh, I should have done that differently. I should have done that differently. And so we can go through. And you, in fact, you can do that. Do that today. Do that tomorrow. Look at your life and look at your spiritual journey and go, are there areas that maybe I've been negligent in? And is that why in my work, my relationships, in different dimensions of my life, is that why I'm experiencing some of the challenges? Because I haven't really given this priority. And so this next thought that we're t- talking about, clarifying our priorities, God was calling the people to go back and really get focused on the temple. And you go, well, why? In fact, reading through the Old Testament passages related to this, you'll find that as they were building the temple, some of the older people were weeping Mm -hmm. because it looked dismal compared to the first temple. It didn't look like Solomon's temple. It had been ransacked. That had been destroyed. It had been knocked down. And now you've got the rebuilding of what is basically sort of a makeshift temporary structure, and it's not at all what they expected it to be. So you have this mixed emotion going on. So why would God want them to clarify their priorities around a physical location? So let me read this, Haggai 2 verse 9. The future glory of this temple will be greater than its past glory, says the Lord of the heaven's armies. And in this place... I will bring peace. So here God's speaking to the people, and he's reminding them, the reason I want you to build a temple is not so that you have a structure in your city that everybody goes, oh, isn't that great? We got a place that we can go to and hang out and worship. God's going, I have a providential purpose for this temple. And in fact, there's a day coming where the glory of this temple is going to be greater than the past glory. You go, Doug, what does that mean? We just go back 70 years earlier and get into the book of Daniel and start reading Jeremiah and Daniel. And you go, God said, I am sending my messenger. I'm sending my Messiah. My Messiah is coming and he is coming to the temple. See, God does everything intentionally. It's all tied together. And when you look at the priorities that God was calling his people to, he said, you're so consumed with your day-to-day activities. You've lost sight of the trajectory of who you are and what I'm calling you to in the big picture. And so as we journey through this, really this thought takes us into the next one, Mm -hmm. which is? The next thought is? I'll throw it to you. (laughs) (laughs) Never lose sight of God's plan. Never lose sight of God's plan. In uh, Haggai chapter 2, verses 6 to 9, if we could have it on screen, I want you to notice how many times in that scripture you will find the words, I will. I will again shake the heavens and the earth. I will shake all the nations. I will fill this place with glory. I will bring peace. These are all the promises that God had for the people of Israel at that time. And I think, Pastor Doug, as we we look at this today, I think these are promises that we could look at as well and say, as God promised to those people and was saying, look, stay stay on the plan. Understand what I'm doing. 
don't be in such a place where you're losing track and, you, and you've come off the roadmap that you don't know what I'm doing. He was saying, let me remind you of what's to come. God always reminds us of what's to come. It's, it, it was interesting, we were discussing um, the Beatitudes, and a lot of times we think about the Beatitudes as far as like it having a present day significance, and it does. But Jesus was speaking about an ultimate time where all of those things would be taking place. So when you think about the Beatitudes, think about a time when the, the poor, uh, what is it, the poor will be? The, those who mourn will be comforted. Yes, those who mourn will be comforted. Yeah. And the poor in spirit will... You got me. Yes, well, I, I got myself too. But some <laughs> of them are saying it. But think about the Beatitudes as being a future time. A future time. You know, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. He wasn't just talking about in the now, he was talking about when he comes back. And all of what he was saying back then at Haggai, what he was saying through Christ, and what he continues to say to us now, is pointing to a future time when he'll come back and set up his kingdom. Yeah, we chatted, so we were talking a little bit about that because people often tie Jesus to his words in the present moment. And uh, even you and I actually went deeper on that one, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Right. Because often we take that verse and, and we do quote it into our story immediately, and we go, well, that's God's plan for right now. And you go, it is. But Jesus used the framing of the language in a very specific way, for they will be comforted. There is a mm -hmm. future connection to this. In other words, Jesus was always projecting towards that God has a much bigger plan in life. And here's the thing. I was thinking about how we lose sight of God's plan. How does that happen? How is it we live our days and we go from Monday to Saturday and then we show up on Sunday and we have a moment like this and it's fantastic. We connect together and then by Wednesday morning, you are like way down in the middle of the week. And the thought struck me. Sometimes it's either the pressures of life or conversely the pleasures of life. Mm -hmm that tend to obscure what is most important in life. Sometimes I become so consumed when I get a phone call and somebody who's a close friend is going through a weighty situation and, and I immediately take the pressure on me. Instead of casting my burden on Jesus, I don't take the big long view. I take the short term, what do I need to do and how do I respond to this? And there's a right component to that. But I start to bear things that Jesus never called us to do. Or there's moments when you're celebrating and you got your new job and you get your new house and you got your car and your family and everything is just going right. And God takes great pleasure in our celebration moments, but not at the expense of our relationship with Him. He never wants our difficulties or our desires to distract us from staying focused on His plan. So when I look at the story and I look at what, you know, Jesus tells us here when he goes through the New Testament and he reveals through his gospel the coming of the kingdom of God. It is both now and not yet. It's coming. And I look at what Haggai says to the people and he reminds them, don't lose sight of why God has brought you back to this land. You are here because he is fulfilling his promise. Jesus, friends, Jesus is coming again. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's something we have to keep on our radar all the time and filter my day-to-day -day activity through the reality of what God is doing in my life. Mm -hmm. So as we prepare for communion, I'd like you to just take your elements and prepare yourself, but I'd like to read Hebrews chapter 12, verses 25 to 29. And the word says this, be careful that you do not refuse to listen to the one who is speaking the one being Jesus. For if the people of Israel did not escape when they refused to listen to Moses, the earthly messenger, we will certainly not escape if we reject the one being Jesus who speaks to us from heaven. When God spoke from Mount Sinai, his voice shook the earth. But now he makes another promise and the, and the author of Hebrews actually quotes the book of Haggai when he says these words. Once again, I will shake not only the earth, but the heavens also. Verse 27, this means that all of creation will be shaken and removed so that only unshakable things will remain. Since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. 
And maybe in some way, shape, or form, God has had to shake you in some way. I know God has had to shake me in the time to get me right back to where I should be, and he's still doing it. But you know, when we come to the table of communion, I believe what Jesus was doing, because when the disciples were with him, their world was shaking at that time. And Jesus offered his body and he offered his blood and he said, this is the way home. Do these things in remembrance of me and you will never lose your way. And as we partake today, I want to invite you to take the the symbol of the broken body of Jesus. And, And if you haven't broken it yet, I just want you to break it in half. So that's in two. And we do this in celebration of what God has done through Christ, but we do this in celebration of what he's going to do in the future to come. Pray with me. Father, we thank you today. God, Lord, there's been times where we have been negligent. There's been times where we've, been, we've needed to have been reminded of what our priorities are. But God, your plan has never changed. And for that, we are grateful. And this is why we celebrate today, Lord. Because we know, Lord, that everything is on track with you. So God, as we partake of this symbol of the broken body of your son, we do this with grateful hearts, with celebration of what you have done, of what you are doing, and what you are going to do. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Take the cup with me. As Jesus hung on the cross, his lifeblood was ebbing out of his body. And just before he died, He pronounces, he makes this just incredible declaration. It is finished. Mm -hmm. This was not a weak resignation that he somehow lost to those that had tortured him and hung them on that cross. Mm -hmm. This was a bold declaration that what God had spoken through Haggai was being fulfilled through Jesus and was going to be fulfilled through his next coming, his second coming. Thank you. And as his blood left his body, it is finished, was a reminder that you can find your way home, that you can come back into relationship with your heavenly Father because the promised Messiah, the Son of God, the one who forgives the sin of the world and the one who redeems us and brings us into the family was faithful to the call. Mm -hmm. So every time we hold this cup, we are reminded we're not just finding our way home, I'm reminded that God is saying to us, welcome home. Let's take the cup together. Let's pray. Father, we take a moment right now and we just pause with hearts of humility. We surrender our thoughts, our minds, our lives to you. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would make true in our hearts the word and the spirit of the word that was shared today. That we would not be people that would be negligent in our relationship with you. That we would have the best marriages, the best in our work employment situations, the best in our family dynamics, the best in our faith expression. Because we give you priority in all that we do. I pray for those that are maybe listening today and realize how easy it is for other things to displace you as our number one priority in our life. And I pray, God, that all of us would just today make that promise one more time to say, God, I make you, I choose you to be first and foremost in everything I do and every dimension of my life. And would you help all of us? Father, remind us that we live in tents, not towers. We're sojourners. And there's a day coming that you're going to shake this heaven and you're going to shake these earths. And the Bible says they're going to pass away. And then you're bringing a new heaven and you're bringing a new earth. And that's the kingdom of God that we will be a part of. So may our our attachment to this world be temporal and light. 
but may our hearts be fixed on that which is eternal and that which is promised. And I pray it in Christ's name. Amen.